Good evening, ladies, gentlemen, brothers and sisters, boys and girls. Thank you for coming to Valley Church. My name is Frank Chen. I'm one of the pastors at Valley. We lovely to see you all to here to enjoy our concert. Today we are so joyful to have uh, our famous pianist Sandra Shen gonna bring us her uh, inspiration from above piano concert. Do you know that uh, in 2007, Sandra hosts her first piano concert, Inspiration From Above, at the Valley Church. After 17 years, she come back again. Yeah, so now let's welcome Sandra Shen. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so wonderful to be here, and um, I know today this is a very special time, and many of you probably got the invitation because somebody loved you very much to bring you here. Um, so when I was a student at the Music Conservatory, one thing fascinated me, um, that was how these composers they seem to live such difficult and challenging lives, but they continue to write such positive and encouraging music instead of uh, becoming uh, a bitter complaint in their music. And I, I couldn't find the answer until with the help of my husband, um, we started doing some research, and then we found that these five composers, they have something in common, and that is they share the same faith. And this faith also um, sustained them through many of the tough, uh, difficult situations in life. So um, in today's concert, I will share some stories, their quotes, and then I will uh, share some musical background before I play each piece. Uh, first composer is Johann Sebastian Bach. Uh, he was from generations of musicians. He was the sixth generation of musician in his family, and he was the youngest. However, sadly, he was only 10 that he lost both his parents and he went on to become the best of all the Bach and was named the father of classical music. He only lived to be 65 years of age, but he had more than a thousand compo compositions. And many times, if you look at the manuscript on um, beginning, he oftentimes wrote JJ, which means uh, Jesus help me in Latin and SDG at the end, Soli Deo Gloria, which means to God alone be the glory. Such a humble servant of music. And um, not only he worked really hard, he also um, lived very hard. He had 20 kids. <laughs> <laughs> He's a very productive man. <laughs> and very consistent too. <laughs> yeah. And he also gave music a definition it says, the ultimate end and final goal of all music shall be nothing but the honor of God and the renewal of the soul. So I would like to play for you a very familiar tune that is from uh, Yesu Joy of Man's Desiring. And in this piece, it shows the intimate relationship and the joy that comes from it. So you can hear this a lot in weddings. And how does um, Bach shows this intimate relationship? Uh, you can hear triplets throughout this piece. And a triplet is um, three notes and one beat. And so throughout this, um, you'll hear this triplet underpinning. And um, three is a very special number at church. Um, it symbolizes God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They have such intimate relationship that brings this joy. So here is Yesu, joy of man's desiring.
And the next composer is um, Mozart. <laughs> Mozart, when he was three, he was observing his sister having a lesson with his father. And after the sister had already played all the pieces, he jumped up to the bench and played everything that Nanaro just played. And father was astonished and started giving him piano lessons. So you can see um, this picture, uh, Nanaro was singing and little Mozart was playing and father is playing the violin. They went on tour. So you can see the next picture, uh, from 7 to 10, he already went through big cities uh, in Europe. However, he's not as blessed as me. He didn't come to Valley Church in Cupertino. <laughs> he missed out. <laughs> he missed out. And at age 8, he wrote his first symphony. And at age 12, he wrote his first opera. And when he was 25, he moved to um, the capital of music in Vienna. There, his income was um, unsta unstable, plus he didn't have um, finance managing skills. So in nine years, he moved 12 times. And um, he had six kids, and four died very young in infancy, and his um, wife was constantly ill, needing expensive treatment. However, in his music, we don't often hear this stress. We hear this heavenly joy. And so um, we can see in his, um, in his diary, he once said this, let us put our trust in God and console ourselves with the thought that all is well if it is in accordance with the will of the Almighty. So he has such great faith, even in difficult situations, he still looked up and put his trust in God. Um, he, um, he got into so much debt, actually when he was 33, his debt was two years of his salary, and then he passed away when he was 35. So what a short life. But um, I would like to play for you the last piano sonata he wrote, the last movement. And in it, I seem to see an uh, opera. So I would like to share with you the opera that I hear. Um, so in the beginning, it sounds like a beautiful day like today. And you can hear there's a woman walking down the street. And this woman is not alone. She has a young child because you can hear the left hand running up and down, very active. Okay, you, you already hear him. And um, not only this child is very active, uh, he also is very capable of showing affection. So you can hear almost he's putting his head on Mama's shoulder and said, Mama, I love you. And why is he showing such great affection? Because he has a wish. He really wants an iPad. <laughs> And so you can hear his voice going higher and higher. Mama, I need an iPad. <laughs> and then Mama's voice goes low. Son, you really don't need it. <laughs> but all my classmates had it. <laughs> Son, you're too young to handle something so evil. <laughs> <laughs> and so you can hear. Of course, when he got rejected, what does he do? <laughs> Why can't I have it? Why can't I have it? And of course, uh, Papa comes back home and joins the discussion, and there's some tension going on. So at the end, does this child get an iPad or not? Um, I'll play the piece and you use your imagination and we'll compare our answers later. <laughs> Thank you. 
So what do you think? Do you think he got the iPad? Yes? Uh, no, he didn't get the iPad? Oh, if he didn't get the iPad, maybe it will end like this. <laughs> but did you hear the yippee? Did you hear the yippee at the end? He's like, yippee! And I think from Mozart's opera, we all see that there is always happy ending. He, put, he leaves us a big smile to go home with. Um, the next composer, however, is a little bit different. You can see um, Beethoven, after Mozart passed away, Beethoven moved to Vienna. There he's, uh, he got a little bit more lucky he had actually support from nobilities, and he's got support from the musical society, recognizing his genius and talent and his work. So he had a bright future in front of him. However, at this time, he started hearing the buzzes in his ears. So he went to the doctor, and the doctor said, don't worry, um, just take my medicine and you'll be better. Use my treatment. However, it got worse and worse until one day, 19 years later, he couldn't hear the church bell across his apartment and he knew he lost his hearing completely. Um, during that 19 years, he considered ending his life because he didn't know how to face the fact that he would lose his hearing. And for such a talented, incredibly gifted, deeply passionate musician, artist, and composer. How is, the, how is he gonna face the future? And he wrote a very famous letter called the Heiligenstadt Testament. And in it, he exposed his most vulnerable feelings and emotions to his brother. He was ready to say goodbye to them. And after he wrote it, however, he didn't uh, take action and he just put the letter away. And in the letter, um, one of the example he said was, um, when I'm standing with my friend, my, my friend can hear the tree, um, the birds on, in the tree singing, but I hear nothing. It was once my best instrument, now become my shame. So you can imagine um, the kind of turmoil that's going on in his heart. And during this suffering, this time of struggle, he said this, I have no friend, I must live by myself. I know, however, that God is nearer to me than others. I go without fear to him. I have constantly recognized and understood him. And it seemed like in the suffering, he found a hidden treasure. He found God's presence with him, God Emmanuel, that provided comfort and strength. Um, and so the piece I would like to share with you tonight is his, from his last piano sonata when he composed, he already lost all his um, hearing. And this piece has two movements. The first movement is about struggle, and the second movement is about reconciliation. And so in the first movement, you can already hear this incredible uh, tension, almost like he's raising his fist to fate and like, I am not giving up. And there is incredible uh, fast notes going, uh, swirling around. And in the second movement, the funny thing is he calls it an arietta. Aria is a song. 
arietta means a small song. However, this song um, spins as a variation and turns out to be a 30 minute long piece. <laughs> so um, the theme is very simple. It's do, so, so, re, so, so. Since you're gonna hear it over and over, so might as well we all sing this. <laughs> do, ready, and. Do, so, so, re, so, so. Wow, this is such beautiful choir. <laughs> I wish I can hear you sing. <laughs> all right, so here um, you can hear the, th the theme is uh, one beat, basically um, one note unit. And then the first variation you can hear in the right hand there are two notes and left hand there are two notes, almost like the two footsteps. So Beethoven found a friend. And then um, in the second variation you can hear like they're swinging. And then the next variation, you can hear that he is doing some experiment on the offbeats. And then there is a whole page of accents on offbeats. So it's almost like one and two and three and four and one and. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? It's almost like, wow, well, we found the person who discovered jazz. <laughs> and, and then um, the whole register shifts. So in Beethoven's late period music, in, um, especially in piano and string quartet, you can hear he's really pushing the limits. Um, higher register goes higher and higher, and lower register go lower and lower. And then um, he has these long trills, just pages of those. And one time he was saying that th these trills are just like the breath of God breathing into us. And the sound on that high register is almost just like a, a mysterious realm, and heaven just opened up. Did you hear the do so so in there, re so so? No, it's okay. He couldn't hear anyway, so. All right, so it's. It's hidden inside. And then um, there's one place that's very special. It's just like single note on the very high register and then one very low. It just seems like in this whole universe, you're so alone. And then we go through a series of key changes, almost like in a tunnel trying to find a, a way out. And then when the theme comes back again. It's like a song of thanksgiving. I just always feel like, wow, this is like deliverance, like so free, and there's no more bar lines anymore. And then the, the very end, uh, he brings back the theme again, and that completes the whole journey and the whole cycle. So here is Beethoven's Sonata, Opus 111, Second Movement, Arietta. Thank you. 
Isn't that incredible music? Can you imagine coming from somebody who couldn't hear, but he could hear so much more, almost like his earthly ears got blocked out, but he heard even more breakthrough sounds, um, incredible breakthroughs. Just, I, if you play this for anybody, they probably would not say this is a classical period piece. <laughs> yeah, it, and so um, the next composer is Chopin. Chopin was born in Poland and when he was born, um, Poland actually was not uh, in power. You can see in this map, it's already being occupied by different powers. And he came from a very devout uh, Catholic family. Uh, his parents would pray for him every day. Um, but when his musical talent was very apparent, People in Poland had a wish that he would go out of Poland and make a name for Poland. And he actually did. He succeeded it. And um, so later, when he was 19, he left and he eventually settled in Paris. However, um, when he was um, out of the country, he kept receiving more news of these devastating news from home. So his faith was challenged. He was thinking, if there is really a God who is, exists, um, how would he allow such evil to come to my country? And he couldn't find an answer for that. So he left um, the faith of his youth. Um, however, he had a very good friend who, was, who is a priest. Uh, his name was Jello Wiki. And uh, he would constantly come and um, visit Chopin, and they would talk about um, God. And then Chopin got, at one point, he just said, all right, if you want me to get baptized, I'll just baptize right now. But it's, I'm doing this for you, not really my heart. So um, the priest friend, of course, said, no, I don't want that. Um, I, I'll wait. And eventually, Chopin had um, uh, um, TB, um, and he was constantly coughing blood, and he was very ill. And even doctors already proclaimed that he could not live over this night. And however, uh, he continued to live. And um, so three days before he passed away, um, his priest friend came to visit him and gave him a cross in his hand. And when Chopin saw the cross, streams of tears just came down his cheeks because the cross is a symbol of God's love to us. And so his friend, Jaluiki, said, um, this, this, he wrote down this paragraph um, about when Chopin passed. He said, Patience, trust in God, even joyful confidence never left him in spite of all his suffering till his last breath. In the midst of the sharpest suffering, he expressed only ecstatic joy, touching love of God, kissing a cross, and then holding it to his heart. Chopin's last words were, I'm at the source of blessedness and he made his reconciliation with God. How incredible that he knew he had the promise um, that Jesus went to prepare a, a place for us and he's gonna come and take us uh, with him. Um, and so Chopin knew where he was going. He had this promise. And um, when Franz Liszt heard about this part, um, this story, Franz Liszt said, oh, how I wished Chopin would quickly write a piece right there at that moment, what that would sound like. <laughs> but um, we'll probably have to wait till we're in heaven to hear that piece. And um, so the piece I would like to play for you is from his fourth ballad. And ballad means a story. And in here, you can also hear this theme
And every time this theme appears again, um, it's almost like snowballing effect. It gets bigger and bigger, and you can hear the struggle. And there are some little moments of blissful beauty. And um, so some people said in this short piece, you can hear all the emotions of humankind. Um, and at one point, it's very dramatic where the music just stops. And all of a sudden, you don't know if this legend is alive or he's dead. And after a few quiet chords, then the coda comes. It's almost as if he, he pulled his sword again and then fought all the way to the end, never look back and never give up. So here is Chopin's fourth ballad.
there is no intermission, so. <laughs> I just shared with you many dead people's story. Do you want to hear my story? Yes. So I was born in Taiwan. My mother was Chinese, and my father was actually from the Bay Area. And um, so when I started piano lesson when I was four, you can already see um, the differences between the Eastern and the Western way of encouraging kids. My mom was with a stick. <laughs> practice. <laughs> because I was lazy, I didn't want to practice. And then my dad was sitting on the other side of the living room, and he would clap like how you clap for me. <laughs> and so my mom saw that I was responding to my dad more. So she started making apple pie. And so if I pass all my pieces, then I would get an apple pie when I get home. And I didn't realize how much work that was until I tried to make one. Uh, so her apple pie technique got better and better as I was passing my songs. And, um, so, and I was getting more, gaining more and more weight, too, <laughs> to the point that you couldn't see my neck. <laughs> and um, so I was... Um, in such a loving family, and eventually I went to the music school. And when I was 13, um, the school um, dean, the music department, uh, called me into the office and said, we're selecting um, a few students to go to Germany and Austria this summer for the summer festival. So would you like to go? And of course I wanted to go. I wanted to go where these composers came from. So to me, it was like a pilgrimage trip to go see and visit and to learn. And I was tremendously honored and excited. So when we got there, uh, the pianists were sent to Austria into the mountain where they actually shoot Sound of Music. Uh, it was a beautiful mountain. We were living with the farmers, have the fresh milk every morning and yogurt. Um, and so the, the lessons were in this castle-like uh, architecture, and there were pianos around the room from different periods. And so all the students from all over the world would sit together like this, and then we would take turn, go up and play, and the uh, master would be teaching us in front of everybody. So after I played, I thought I did pretty well, and uh, however, the master was not too happy with me, and he was very frustrated. So he eventually, he wrote a big X on the first page of my music, and threw it on the floor in front of everybody and said, you know nothing about music. Oh my goodness, I feel like I committed the serious crime. I just want to dig a hole and hide and go home. But I didn't speak German at that time and I didn't know the way to escape. Um, and uh, so I was trapped. However, my being trapped there became such a blessing to me because um, this master, Jörg Demus, he said, being a musician, you're not to use the instrument to show off your talent and whatever you want to do, but you are a serious musical servant. You need to spend time and understand the markings on the score and not just play whatever you want. <laughs> and, um, and then he would show us and give examples and just leading us into understanding these incredible uh, pieces. So I learned so much that summer. And when I uh, went back and when I was in high school, uh, I had a new, new teacher. And this teacher was Michael Dellinger. He's actually from Ohio. And um, he was such a great teacher to me. And I respect him so much until one day I heard that uh, he was being mistreated at one of the universities that he was also teaching at. Uh, the, the university had hired a new dean, 
and the new dean had canceled out my teacher's classes and gave it to the new dean's friend to teach. Oh, when I heard that, I just felt this injustice done to him that is totally not right because he's such a devoted teacher and he has so much to give. So um, when we were having our piano lesson, um, I asked him about it. I said, um, I heard that you're being mistreated at this university. So he said, Sandra, at first I was very troubled by this, but now I can love my dean through the love of Jesus. And when I heard that, I almost just want to say, why do you want to love somebody who has done such bad things to you? And, and I, I, I just couldn't say it. Somehow it just like stopped in my throat. I couldn't get it out. And I saw in him such radiant light. Um, and at that moment, I, I realized that is the kind of love that is bigger than ourself. And I was astonished at that time. And um, I just looked at him, unbelieving. And, uh, and then he said, Sandra, you can too, because God loves you so much that he wants to have an intimate relationship with you. He sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross that your, your sins can be forgiven. And at that moment, I thought, who is this God that wants to come and have a relationship with me? And I was very touched and very moved. I said, I want to have a relationship with God. So he just led me into prayer in that little practice room. And he, um, at that moment, I invited Jesus to come into my heart. I didn't really fully understand at that time uh, what that all meant. It just happened so quickly that I sensed something so beautiful and so beyond me that I really want to search more. And so um, when I graduated, I came to the States. I went to Peabody uh, Conservatory to study in Baltimore. And there are not many Chinese restaurants there <laughs> at that time. And so one day I got a phone call and this lady said, oh, um, we're from the Chinese church down the street. Um, we really need a pianist. Could you come and play for us? And I thought, oh, I'm here to study, not to play for church. Um, it will take away my time. But then this lady continued and said, you know, in our church, there's an old lady who can make really good scallion pancakes, the Chinese style. And I thought, okay, I'll play for you, whatever you want me to play. Do you come now to pick me up if you want? And so he sp she spoke my language, and I surrendered. And because of their need, it became my supply of pancakes and Bible studies and um, choir practice and uh, prayer, prayer meeting, Bible study, and all that good stuff. Just that was when I started to get to know this God that I invited into my heart. And then in the Bible, I started reading, and then I started realizing, wow, God has a purpose for my life. God actually has given us such wonderful guidance in life. And so I couldn't have... Uh, enough. And six years uh, in Baltimore just passed so quickly. I got my master's, and um, after talking to my parents, I decided that I would stay in the States and do some more competitions. So um, one day, I got a phone call from my uncle in Taiwan, and he said, Sandra, your father just had a heart attack. And you need to prepare your heart. And I was not prepared. So at that time, after I hang out, I could only pray to God, God, if this is really my father's time, then let him go very, very peacefully, not having any regret. 
And a few minutes later, my uncle called again, and then he said, your dad passed away. And it was so difficult for me to accept. I wish I could talk to him again and tell him how much I appreciate all the applause that he has given me and all the support and encouragement that he has given me. He's always saying, Sandra, you're number one. I know I was not, <laughs> and I'm not, and, uh, but I know in my father's heart that I'm always number one, and he, he really recognized and, um, and give his very best support at any possible um, ways. So that evening turned out to be the Christmas Eve service at that church. So I went, and after the service, pastor's wife made all these um, little verse, verses um, on little strips of paper. So we would go get it, and then that would be our Christmas gift. And the one I got it was um, when Jesus was about to go up to the cross, he said to his disciples, peace, I leave with you. Peace, I give to you. Now as the world gives, do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. And at that moment, that was exactly what I was feeling. I was troubled and I was very afraid. I didn't know what my sister and I would do. Um, my dad was the tree, like the big, secure um, shoulder in our life. And all of a sudden, he left. And all of a sudden, it's like there is this big emptiness in my heart. And I didn't, my mom is a homemaker. And I didn't know how my sister was going to finish her, her um, university studies. And uh, just so many thoughts and worries come to my heart and my mind. But when this verse came to me, it was almost a like God is reassuring me that my earthly father has gone, but my heavenly father is still there, and he will take care of me. His grace is sufficient for me. So whenever I was feeling anxious again, I just meditate on this verse again and come to God saying, I really need you. I really need your peace. I don't have this peace. Please be with me. And somehow God's word just in his magical way, just calming me down when I come to him and knowing he's the one who calms the storms. And uh, I realize this peace we were talking about was not just um, not having anything happen in life, but it's in the storms that we can have this peace when God is with you, when you have God's presence. And that's when I realized, oh, this is what um, Beethoven's quote was about. I go to him constantly and know him. And so through through this experience, I just hang on to his word. So after my dad's funeral, I came back from Taiwan. I was to prepare for my first international competition in two months um, in Hilton Head. And at that time, I really didn't have the strength or um, the kind of motivation to go full forth. Uh, I was just constantly feeling that emptiness in my heart. Um, and however, God knows my need. He prepared for me a Russian teacher, authentic Russian teacher, <laughs> for me to stay in her house. And every morning, I would go practice for two hours before she wakes up. And then when she wakes up, we would have two-hour um, piano lesson. And then we have lunch, and then I go practice while she teach other kids. And then occasionally I would hear this, Sandruli, lift your second finger. <laughs> Drop from your shoulder. You're not using your shoulder weight. And she's, 
shouting across the hall. Like, she's in the front of the house, I'm at the back of the house. And I was looking for cameras. It's like, how does she know I'm not lifting my finger? <laughs> she said, Sandruli, I can't hear your sound. What is this sound, puny little sound? And then so she would, she would be so direct at me. I feel like I'm a seriously ill patient that finally found a good doctor who can treat me. And so every no was wrong, every no was net, net. And uh, so, uh, and then after she teach all those strings of uh, kids, then she would come to me and we would work again at night uh, for another two hours before um, we go to bed. So it was like 12 hours every single day. Uh, it, to the point, I feel like I have no more music in me. It was just uh, this slavery. And, uh, and occasionally at night, I would still cry, and she would come and hold me and said, Sandru, I understand. I also lost my father. And just really, uh, really great teacher to walk with me at that moment. And so after two months, I went to Hilton Head. And um, surprisingly, I passed the first round. And seeing all these Juilliard students, I thought, ah, oh, maybe I won't, I won't get anything, but I'll just give my best. And another surprise, um, God gave me this first prize at the competition during, um, <laughs> to God be the glory. And so I, at that, the whole journey, not only experiencing peace, I also experiencing the strength that came beyond me and to go through with it, um, not giving up and just keep going. And um, in the Bible it says um, we have this um, treasure in our vessel is to show that the power is not from us but from him. So, and it is true, I sense his power with me. I sense his strength when I'm weak and I sense his hope when I feel despair, when I feel I didn't know what, how to continue on. He showed me the way, and he is a very good friend in my life, and I experience his love in many ways. Um, and I wish all of us can have this uh, loving God in our life. This is my biggest treasure next to my husband, <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, this is the end of my story. Of course, there are so many stories, but um, tonight we have time limits, otherwise we'll be here all night. Um, and I have one more piece to share with you. This is Franz Liszt. Uh, Liszt was very close to his son, uh, his father. And um, when he was a little boy, his father would tell him stories and said, I once was a priest, but I only did it for two years. And so little Liszt heard that and said, I want to be a priest when I grow up. But he, when he went to the monastery, and the monastery actually rejected him. They knew he had such enormous musical talent. So they said, you should go on and become a musician. And so he did, and he became like this rock star of piano. And you can see that um, he has such beautiful profile, handsome look. Um, every concert was packed with audiences, admirers. They would come and worship, and especially beautiful women. And uh, so he fell into temptation, and he had um, three kids with this married woman. Um, and they never um, got married, and eventually they separated. And when he was 48, um, two of the elder um, siblings died in their 20th, and um, it really broke his heart. So Liz started a conversation with God again and said, why are you doing this to me? You took away my kids and break my heart. How am I going to live? And four years later, when he was 52, he found a monastery near Rome. And he said, I have never lived in such 
poor, conditioned place. My room only has three things, a desk, a bed, and an upright piano missing a D. <laughs> And he said, but it is here that I sense God's peace and his comfort, his consol consolation. So he returned to the Lord. He cleaned up his life. And you can see the old list. That is the outfit that um, he wore um, after he became an abbot. And he said, this is my new identity. I'm a saved man. Um, experiencing God's salvation, I'm totally changed. So uh, he gave many um, fundraising concerts and also his master classes when there are poor family uh, kids coming. He would not take their money and even he, he would give them money and said, um, bring it home and help, help your family. So he was such a generous man that he died without savings. <laughs> he used it all. And um, so he also gave music a definition. He said, music must recognize God and people as its living source, must hasten from one to the other, to ennoble, to comfort, to purify men, to bless and praise God. And once uh, he was invited by the cardinal to come to this beautiful estate. And you can see in a picture, this place still exists in, in Italy. And I heard it's really beautiful. You can hear the sounds of water. There are hundreds of fountain with sculptures. So he was so inspired by the sound of water. He wrote this um, Je de Villa d'Est. And when I was practicing in the middle of the piece, I see this uh, Latin, and it ended up coming from um, the Gospel of John in the Bible. And that's when Jesus was talking to the Samaritan lady and said, whoever drinks this water I give um, will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And how he relates with this woman who had um, five men and still was not satisfied. And List had many women in his life, and also he was not satisfied until he came back to the Lord and have that deep relationship. And then he was totally changed. And so in this music, you can hear this fountain from down to up. And also you hear this um, small fountain eventually welling up to a big spring. And at the end, it almost feels like um, the sun just came out, like the sunrise, and then to the full splendor at the very end. Um, at times you hear maybe water drops, um, sounds of streams. So use your imagination. This is uh, Jodo Villa Des from List.
Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. I believe you all feel that Sandra brought us a wonderful feast. I feel so full. You know, I didn't have my dinner today, but now I feel I don't feel any angry at all. So uh, hungry. Yes. Yeah, so I was speechless with all her talented music. And uh, three announcements we're gonna give you is on your program in the back. You can see uh, actually May fifth we have another concert. It was presented by our Valley Church, our Valley Hambill Academy, and uh, Valley Children's Choir and Valley Youth Orchestra. It's on May fifth, two thirty in the afternoon. And second is uh, Sandra's has. Oh, oh, you will say something. Oh, okay. Is it okay? After the announcement, okay. yeah, of course. <laughs> Second thing is, uh, Sandra's husband, they want to give away all the CD and DVD. So when you walk away, you can get the CD and DVD. It's free of charge. Yeah. Third is we prepare the snack for all the, everyone, all the audience. Okay? <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. So I want to thank Pastor Frank and Jean and Hugh uh, for organizing and preparing for this event and all of you for coming tonight. Um, thank you so much. So I, th I really want to share with you one of my favorite hymns. I thought we should, we should sing something together before we leave. So um, when I was a little girl, I remember my dad would be uh, holding my hand and taking me to the bus stop and watching me get on the bus and then leave. And while walking on the s busy streets in Taipei with all these motorcycles, buses, and cars, I just felt so secure, like his hand is um, holding me and I have no fear. Uh, now he's not here anymore. But God says he holds our hands. He even holds us in his arms. And he knew us when we were born. So, um, so I would like to invite you to sing with me. It says, we really don't know what tomorrow will, will happen. But we know the Lord who holds tomorrow is also holding our hands. So here is... The hymn. Please join me if you know how to sing this. Slide, please. <laughs> Next, I don't.
Let's pray together. Dear Father God, I thank you so much for this evening. We feel like we're being surrounded by these clouds of witnesses from these composers giving us music impacting generations, even now. Thank you for the gift of music, and thank you for giving us all the different gifts that we could glorify your name. You give us a purpose of life, and I thank you that you love us so much. You send your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, that our sins are forgiven. You love us with unconditional love. I thank you for this incredible opportunity to share this music. May all the glory be to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Sandra. Yeah, someone may ask, this is a free concert? How can, I would love to pay $100. So you know, Sandra and Raymond, they, uh, they just let us all know that uh, they reject any offering. If you love this music, please, next time, we're gonna have series two, three, and four. Please invite your friends, especially those who, non who was non-Christian, you can let, lead them to enjoy these concerts. Again, we're gonna give thanks to Sandra and Raymond. Thank you for bringing us such a feast. Thank you, thank you all. Sorry. Oh, Raymond's parents are here too. Yeah, thank you. No, oh, okay, okay, thank you. So. Um, welcome to Valley Church. Our Sunday service is starting from 1045. Hope we can see you. Have a blessing night. See you then. <laughs>